coming up here in the, the near future. And so I just wanted to share some with you about that. And then we'll, uh, we'll look at a, a few scriptures as well. Uh, you know, talking primarily about missions, which that, that involves all of us, doesn't it? You know, uh, each one of us are involved in missions, uh, whether that be uh, right here, across the street, next door, uh, wherever it may be. I, I heard someone say, you know, to uh, be involved in missions, it's not about uh, crossing the sea, but seeing the cross. <laughs> that's that's what missions is about, isn't it? And, uh, you know, basically God's called us to be people that are on mission. And that takes a that takes a little different form and fashion for each and every one of us. But uh, he certainly has called us to do that. But uh, just to share with you a, a, a little bit. Uh, tell me when it's about 12 o'clock. And we'll stop. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Uh, that's one of Gary's kind of jokes, right? Uh, he's probably serious, though, right? Okay. No. Uh, no, Gary and I did grow up together in West Texas, Monahans. Anybody know where Monahans is? Um, it's uh, uh, out there west of Midland, Odessa. And, of course, right now it's a whole different place. If you're uh, familiar with what's going on out there in the oil and gas industry all around the Permian Basin in West Texas, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, really, what's going on. But uh, uh, we grew up together there and uh, went to the same church and had some wonderful, wonderful times together. I'm telling you, it was a very unique time. Uh, at that at that time for us and uh, later on we had the privilege of serving together at a church uh, Taylor was around at that time and uh, we were together at a church in Carlsbad New Mexico we had a pretty good time there didn't we Taylor <laughs> And uh, but God's God's blessed us. You know what it's like. Uh, those of you that have enjoyed uh, some long term relationships with uh, friends, you know, there's just something special about it. You know, not everyone uh, can appreciate that. Uh, sometimes we just lose touch with everyone, don't we? But uh, sometimes God can bless you with uh, with one of those unique relationships, and He's blessed Gary and I with that, and we've we've stayed connected and involved, uh, uh, even at a distance sometimes in one another's life for all these years, and uh, praying for one another, helping one another during uh, major challenges in all in our lives like we all go through <laughs> but uh anyway so i'm i'm it's just a blessing to me to be here today and to share with you uh, god allowed me uh, many many years ago to get involved in missions uh, as far as going places you know and of course spent lots of time many many trips in mexico as some of you probably have and had some wonderful early experiences and i think it was during those times when god just really got a hold of my heart at an at an early age and an early time in my life and uh it just gave me such a passion and a heart for uh, missions and basically which is about people right it's it's about people what we're talking about and other other cultures other countries and uh, so he opened doors for me to have some wonderful experiences and one of my first trips overseas was in Russia and this was back in the in the 80s early 80s and you know things were still a little a little dicey there at that time and uh, but i had the wonderful experience of going with someone who was carrying uh, the bible in uh, basically smuggling bibles in at that time and uh, it was just uh, an amazing experience to put the, a bible into the hand of someone who had never had one never read a scripture but they had given their lives to, to christ 
And to be able to do that, you know, it's just it's such an amazing thing. We take a lot for granted, don't we? But uh, so I, I had those experiences and, and in Romania during that same time, which was, uh, you know, serious, still under communist regime at that time. Ceausescu, some of you remember that name and uh, had some great experiences there. And in Turkey, we've made uh, several trips there. But in in 1991, God connected us with uh, Victor Sabo pastor in Serbia and he had requested someone to come and help to help them in different ways you know working with young people which at that time I could have done you know what I mean <laughs> and uh, uh, and so and help with the, uh, reaching to reaching out to young people helping them with music and worship and so we prayed about it and felt like God saying go. And uh, God blessed me with a, a very uh, committed and wonderful helpmate and wife, Krista. And she was ready to go. We, we packed up our three kids and headed. We had to look it up. You didn't even know where it was. Of course, at that time, it was still kind of known as Yugoslavia, that region. And uh, it was basically had just been, you know, during the time of where it had broke up. Tito was no longer on the scene. You know, that was the leader of Yugoslavia. And he was kind of like a benevolent uh, dictator. You know, there's been a few of those in history, you know, and that's that's basically how Tito was. And I'm sure there was a lot of other negative things, but he was he was what they would refer to as a benevolent dictator. He he at least tried to take care of the people, you know, and and that type of thing he was. And but when he left the scene and they they basically broke up and then they began to just rotate leadership you know the the president of of Serbia would be the leader of Yugoslavia for two or three years then the the leader of Bosnia Herzegovina would be the leader of Yugoslavia well that never did work too well because of Serbia you know Serbia was still the communistic stronghold uh, you know with brother Russia and so they basically wanted to control everything and uh, we you know we're familiar with how all that works out and and basically control everything and get rid of who they didn't want which what happened then in 91 shortly after we arrived there is when Serbia invaded Croatia and the war began and so we got there in january and i think it was about three or four months later uh they invaded croatia so we had an interesting time as you can imagine and uh, we were in the northern part of serbia just below hungary because that part of serbia formerly was a part of hungary and you know back uh, world war ii then it became a part uh you know that part became part of Serbia and so the northern part of Serbia which is an autonomous region called Vojvodina is probably at least 60 percent Hungarian people and the rest are Serbs Victor Sabo is Hungarian and but he, he pastors there in Serbia and uh, and so that's what you you have there in that country is that you have the Hungarians and the Serbians along with men, you know others, but that's the main population. And uh, and so we arrived on the scene there in '91 and uh, began learning, and uh, it was a quick learning process. And uh, luckily, even at that time, back. In, in, uh, uh, lots of the younger folk understood English from watching movies. You know, they would watch a movie in Hungarian with an English subtitle and would learn English and, uh, and that type of thing. And so that was beneficial because we could communicate with uh, a, a good amount of young people, young families. But we began learning, you know, Serbian and Hungarian. Uh, 
And so during that year, the best way to, to tell you what it was like, basically in 91 in Serbia and in, in that region was like 20 years earlier in the United States, which some of you might know would, was during the Jesus movement in California and that kind of spread across our country in the late 60s, early 70s. Just a, a great awakening, revival in all the different forms and fashions. Many, many young people coming to the Lord. Well, in 91, in, it wasn't quite that extreme, but there was an amazing hunger and openness among the young people. We would go out into the center of town, which is where everyone would congregate in these little Eastern European towns, down on the square, take our guitars and begin to sing. And in no time, we would have, you know, 60, 70 or more young people gathered around listening. We would sing, you know, these Christian songs. We would share the gospel and, and young people would come to the Lord and give their lives to Christ. And it was just an amazing time. Some of the pastors that are there now that we work with came to the Lord during that time. And so it was an interesting time, you know, that whole year. And then towards the end of the year, we decided to return home. We actually left Serbia the day the United States started the oil embargo against Serbia. We weren't real popular there, if you, you can imagine. But we could have stayed. It wasn't like we really felt our lives in danger. We were in the northern part of Serbia. We were about maybe an hour from the Hungarian border, you know, so we could we could you know get out fairly quickly maybe you know if the border was still open <laughs> but uh, we had interesting time you know but we just a lot of different things had happened and we felt God leading us to come back home and and continue to work with them from here which is what we've basically done since that time we've made many trips uh, and we've involved other churches uh, with the work and the ministry there. So uh, over the last few months, uh, Krista and I began to pray. We've always hoped that God would give us the opportunity to spend more time back over there, more than just a short, you know, two week trip. And so we began to pray about it and felt like God was telling us that now now's the time. And uh, so we began to pursue that. We made a trip over there last fall around Thanksgiving and spent a couple of weeks and made plans to go back. And so we are in the process now of, of uh, doing things to get ourselves ready to move over there. We're, we're gonna spend just as much time as we can. There's basically our goal. Uh, you know, maybe eight to ten months out of the year we'll spend there working with Victor and with these other uh, pastors. And, and the main thing that we, you know, are involved there besides just encouraging the people, you know, I mean, you could spend uh, all your time doing that. Uh, just bringing encouragement to them. They they live under a lot different situations than we live under. You know, the uh, unemployment's about 40% in Serbia. And uh, the economy's just, you know, still really bad. They're still just trying to recover from all the conflict going on through the 90s and everything. And, uh, and so, you know, basically people... You know, people uh, really struggle in in many different ways there, and and so obviously that's you know the church is made up of the people, <laughs> so the churches are really struggle and have difficult times, and uh, alcoholism is a big big thing there because of what people are living under drug addiction, alcoholism, depression. And so, you know, we spend a lot of our time just with the pastors and leaders, encouraging them, just helping them to, to have the vision, you know, to move forward. There's freedom and liberty in that country. 
uh, you know, to practice your faith, whatever that might be. It's the Eastern Orthodox is the religion of Serbia. That's probably 90 percent Eastern Orthodox, which is, you know, if you if you you read about that, the Eastern Orthodox belief is really what we would believe. I mean, they believe in God and, you know, Jesus and his death and resurrection. But you would never hear about it. It's not taught. Uh, you know, it's there's nothing about a personal relationship with Christ. Individuals do not read the scriptures. So it's just uh, pretty much in uh, you could call it pretty much a dead religion in that country. Not to say that there's still not some. You understand what I mean. But it's just there's no young people. There's no young families in the church. Uh, there's no life there. And so, but there's freedom. You know, there's freedom to practice your, your faith there. And God has done a lot of things in the, in the evangelical churches there. Uh, that, you know, they're, the, they're some of the main ones that are doing work in the schools, you know, helping to feed kids and, uh, and all the different needs that, you know, the society has there. The church is very involved. But... Uh, one of the things that we help with is doing home groups. Some of you are involved in those and know how special that can be. You know, it's where you really build relationships and as well as invite people that might not come inside these walls, but they'll come to your home and enjoy a good meal. And, and Hungarians can cook, I'm telling you what. <laughs> uh, and so those are things they need, uh, you know, guidance, direction, motivation and vision for because it's it's the only way they can plant new churches much at all. I mean, obviously, you know, trying to build a building, buy a building, even renting a place, you know, it's just very, very difficult in that type of economy, just like you see in other countries. And so the primary way for for starting new churches is just through the homes you know, and meeting with people. And uh, and so, you know, that's, that's what we are involved in when we're there. And always, of course, in worship and teaching and training worship leaders and then just encouraging the leadership and helping them moving forward in, in other areas. Because there's communities of 20 to 30,000 people in a small town with no church. No Christian church that's preaching the gospel in that whole community. There's about seven or eight million people in Serbia. And, uh, you know, under, say, 30,000 maybe evangelical believers. And it's just, you know, it's hard for us to relate to that, isn't it? I mean, you think, I mean, there's, there's that many believers, what, in Hayes County, I'm sure, you know and uh, churches everywhere and so uh, you know it's it's hard to to understand sometimes and relate to what believers there are experiencing you know the oppression and sometimes the loneliness you know the struggle they have and so you know our prayers for them mean so much and then of course as we go and and just come alongside them you know, and walk with them and what God's called them to do. So I just hope that you'll be praying for Krista and I as we make plans and just move forward on the steps that we're taking to uh, to be over there. I may be going this fall just for an extended visit, maybe a month or six weeks. And then we're going to try to go over there the first of next year, you know, for a for months at a time and we would appreciate your prayers you know i wanted to just look at a few scriptures real quick uh i'm gonna know we don't have we don't have much time but uh you know just to be reminded of i mean why why do we do this missions thing i know uh you here this church has some missionaries that you pray for that you work with that are in other locations and other countries and uh Let's look at uh, 
Matthew 28. Most of these scriptures you're familiar with, but I tell you what, it never hurts to remind ourselves why this is important, and not just important, but it's a mandate from the Lord, isn't it? So let's, let's read these. Matthew 28, 16. Matthew 28, 16. I think it's on the screen. Yeah, it's up there if you want to read it there. Let me read it. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach the new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Look at Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24, 14. It says, And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. We're getting closer. We're getting closer to that. If you want to read about that sometimes, just, uh, you know, Googling unreached people groups and... Uh, uh, we've pretty well cut that in half to what it was, I don't know, I'd just guess, say 20 to 30 years ago. It's been cut in half, the number of unreached people groups in the world. And it's going down And because, you know, there's efforts by so many organizations, churches that are involved in that going to unreached. You know, an unreached people group is where there is no gospel witness. There's no church and anything like that. It's unreached. And so there's so many efforts now of sending teams and groups into these places. And, of course, they go in and they have to learn the language and, and then begin to share the gospel to these, these people. And it's very interesting. You can read a lot about it. But uh, the Scripture says that when that happens so that all nations will hear it, then the end will come. And when the scripture uses the word nations, it's referring to ethnic, ethnic groups, people groups, not a nation as we would think, a country, but each people group. Because obviously, like in some countries, boy, there's many people groups, aren't there? Many. And so, you know, it's not just going into that country, but it's actually reaching every people group that speaks a different language, diff different ethnicity. So that's a that's a great thing to have on your prayer list as you're praying is for these unreached people groups. Let's look at Revelations chapter seven. Read this real quick. We'll see where we're all headed. <laughs> Revelation 7, 9 and 10. Revelation 7, 9 and 10. It says, And after this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, tribe, and people, and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and they worshiped God and they sang blessing and honor and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. 
So that's where we're headed. One of these days we're going to all be gathered around the throne. And just as it says here, a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation, tribe, people, language, everyone is going to be accounted for there standing before the throne. You know, as, as I was saying earlier, how, you know, God's called us all to be involved in missions. And, and I think the thing that's important to keep in mind is one of our greatest, if not the greatest resources we have for missions is prayer. We do many other things. Obviously, finances are needed. Physical bodies are needed. Other things are needed to meet people's needs. But the greatest resource that we have and that each one of us has is prayer. And, you know, the awesome thing about prayer and missions is that you can go anywhere in the world in prayer with God. I mean, God is everywhere, right? He's everywhere. So it's like right now, God's here with us, and God's with this people group, wherever it might be. He's with them. And our prayers, as we lift up our prayers to God, God hears and answers our prayers. Just as he said in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me. And what did he say? I will answer. Call unto me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you know not. And so I just want to encourage you. You know, you might think sometimes, you know, well, what can I do? Uh, the first thing to do is prayer. I mean, that's really, it's what I tell people. I mean, the first thing to do is pray. And you can pray, like we were talking about these unreached people groups, look them up, find where there's unreached people groups, where there's nothing happening there, and begin to pray for God to raise up. What did he say? He said, there's a, the harvest or... It's quiet on the harvest, but the labors are few. Pray. He told us to pray that he would send forth labors into the harvest. So that's what we need to pray is, God, raise up your labors to go to these remaining unreached people groups. And it's just, it's just an amazing resource that we have because we can do it anywhere we're at, any time of day, we can pray. And so that's just an amazing gift and resource that we have. And then as we pray, we obey. Right? I mean, you know, what else can you do? You're praying. You're praying for these certain missionaries. You're praying for these certain areas, people groups. And then you obey. You do what God says. God says to get involved financially, then you obey. You know, if God says, pack your bags, you're going somewhere next week. <laughs> pack your bags. You know, you just you obey. But you start in prayer, don't you? Okay? And, and I just, I can't encourage you enough. I mean, we could speak a long time about this. We've just got about an hour left. Okay? Is that... Uh, is that it, it, it starts in prayer. I mean, it really does. And we can do so much. It's not that, well, the only thing I can do is pray. It's a powerful thing to pray. And so I, I just encourage you, those missionaries that the, your church here is working with, pray for them. Be faithful to intercede for them. God knows their needs. And you know God. And so you just connect with him and intercede for him and ask God to meet their needs. You know, the Lord told the disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, OK, when you pray, do this. And this is and the Lord's prayer is a great prayer to pray for people on the field, for missionaries. You know, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done 
in this land with these people with this missionary there so i just want to encourage you in that that it's a it's a great gift a powerful resource that we need to take more and more advantage of and i just uh, i appreciate you all of you so much and i appreciate the time to be here with you today and uh let's just stand together if we could to pray and i'm going to pray and then the i believe the men are going to come and we're going to move into our time of communion but i'll go ahead and pray and lead us into that now lord thank you so much for the wonderful privilege of prayer Lord, we thank you f that from right here in this place, Lord, we can reach out and pray to every corner of this world. And Lord, we just uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, what you're doing at this time. Lord, we hear... Uh, we hear so many bad things all the time. But Lord, you are doing so many things across this planet. Lord, you are making yourself known to so many people. And we thank you for that. And we just pray for more and more, Lord. Draw people to yourself. Make yourself known to people all over this world, Lord. Lord, those unreached people groups who have never heard your name, who have never heard the gospel, Lord, would you raise up laborers to go to that place? Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you today as we remember what you've done for us at the cross. Thank you for taking our place Lord, thank you for shedding your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Lord, as your word tells us, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we do that today, Lord. We come before you. Cleanse our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.